The body is the hallmark of all movement we animate. From creatures to people and machines, understanding locomotion and animating it in fluid believability will make or break any cartoon. Now there is, of course, a myriad of schools of thought as to the most cost-effective and visually engaging means of simulating movement in 2D. The two overarching schools that you'll see are that of constant movement, such as in Disney movies and many music videos, and that of moving only when necessary, common in cartoons and anime. In time, we all find our niche, but first we have to actually draw the body, and not in the detailed step-by-step -step method recommended for static works. Tineko Pantoa provides some solid insight into how to think about the body and anatomy in simple shapes to make drawing it in hundreds of frames a lot less daunting. In his video on approaching full-figure animation, link below, he presents nine styles of drawing the body on a first pass, so I'll try out each of them in each of the next nine exercises so we can get a sense of which feels right for us. So with that, let's dive right in. So now that we've had our appetizer, let's get into the main course. Another aspect of animation that I haven't really had a chance to do before because I've been so busy trying to make everything detailed and flushed out is taking the entire scene into account. So what I really want to do here is have my character go through this jumping over gap action, but really have it be a whole story from beginning to end, not just three poses that imply something of a story, but an actual story I'm trying to tell, which is a major benefit of using a first-passed system because then I don't get bogged down by details. I'm just focusing on fluidity, animation, storytelling, the entire big picture as a whole. Now what is the story, you may ask? I decided that I was going to go on something with a character walking up and just trotting along, and then he goes, ah, there's a gap, there's something in my way. Hmm, what do I do about this? Look to the right, see if I can't see anything that can help me. Nothing there, look to the left, or maybe the left and then to the right. I haven't quite decided yet. And then, ah, there's nothing. Ah, Hans. All right, and you know what? <sighs> Damn it. I was really hoping there'd be something to go for me. I will not be perturbed. Step back, step back, step back, and running, running, hop over, ah, poof. And then I was thinking, well, how could we finish this? I mean, yeah, we could obviously just finish it with a land. Hey, we're safe. Or we could continue adding a little bit of a comedic bit. So I decided that I would want to have him land and then slip, poof, land on his butt. And then, hmm, hmm. Oh, oh, okay. So if you slip and fall after laying on a gap, your first heart reaction is going to be, oh, I'm going to fall back in. So he gets startled, lands, and then just falls back in relief. Yes, I made it. I am the bestest ever of all time. See you, one particular section that I'm really looking forward to working on is the one I just drew right here where he's looking over the gap in defeat and then stretches back, ugh, stretches his arms out, you know, some sort of like exercise type of limbering up, getting ready. I really, really, really want to focus on emboldening the personality of this character. That's something that I was reminded of when from the 12 principles of animation that I wanted to try to execute better. Overall, I've really felt that a lot of my animations have been too mechanical, because I've been focusing so much on the pose to pose to pose. Which, of course, if I was more experienced, I would know how to look forward at the poses that I'm drawing in pose to pose and take motion and fluidity into account. But I don't have that context yet because I haven't sat down and forced myself to draw with fluidity in mind. So, I'm going to try a technique that I was also reminded of in that wonderful 12 Principles of Animation video, link below for all of your perusing needs, which is straight ahead animation, where I don't know the actual poses that the character is going to go in, I just draw a pose or a frame, go to the next frame, draw it, next frame, draw it, using the onion skins to give me a reference of the distance that I've traveled so far, and I just organically draw each of these actions as they happen, which is much more reflective, of course, of what an actual person or object does in reality. We don't know what we're going to do, but what we do know is what we want to do. So, if I know that I want a character to be walking, and I want them to be walking in a certain way, I keep that walk in mind while I'm animating each of the frames as I go. And because I'm doing nothing but referencing the past motions of past frames, and I'm always scrubbing back and forth between all the frames that I have made to see the progress that my particular motion is making, I'm always conscious of the natural freeform inclinations of that particular motion as opposed to pose to pose with my lack of experience where I'm trying to guess what makes something feel 
like it creates motion and fluidity, by calculating and predicting where a particular appendage is at a particular place in time. So then I got to thinking, with all the time that I'm saving from not having to do more than just one pass, is there anything else that I can also be working on, external to the actual animation itself, that I haven't really gotten a chance to piece away at? And the first thing that came to mind was perspective and environment. All of my environments so far have just been straight up rectangles, from the shelf that the ball was rolling off of, to the stairs that the flower sack was jumping up. But I haven't really had a chance to create a dynamic environment that feels real, taking perspective into account, or any of the other nuances of terrain, etc. So I figured the easiest thing to start off with would just be to use a simple horizon line and vanishing point in two point perspective, since that perspective just seems to make sense in my mind's eye for what I want for this piece. Of course, in order to do that, you need to have, in fact, two points, which really wasn't the easiest thing for me to eyeball. And then it hit me like a brick wall! Dan Beardshaw, one of the artists that I've given an honorable mention to before, has an entire, like, 15-part series on perspective that I've used for practicing before, one of which was how to make a 2D grid using two-point perspective from whatever reference line that you want. So I went back and rewatched the video, which I made using a couple of nifty little techniques, such as using a ruler on my drawing pad, which I hadn't done before. Luckily, I've got this nice one here that has a cork base, so it doesn't do any damage, which is pretty nifty and really convenient to have just randomly found in a drawer somewhere. And with that, I was able to find my two vanishing points that I liked, which were each nice and evenly spaced from either side, found a center point, was able to measure all of my grid spacing off on the lower right, as you can see here, and then follow the helpful steps to create a perfectly balanced, perspectivized grid all the way into the foreground, and the background, and the side ground, all the ground. I covered all of my ground! Now that I have my grid, I need to find a way to separate the actual grid itself from all of the reference lines. And the easiest way to do that was to just dim everything to a really light gray, and then go over the cleaned up grid shape with black lines. Boom! Then comes the fun part, which is actually deciding where I want my gap to be. I figured I would take a little bit of liberty here and do a nice 3D platform that's just sitting there hovering in midair. Just enough to imply that this is a solid object with which the character is walking on, but not really getting too mucked up in all the complexities of what an environment could be, considering that this is just my first shot at actually using a dynamic environment. So in the interest of simplicity, I just took out a section of the grid line right there from the top left to the bottom right, removed that to make the gap, and made the entire rest of the grid the entire rest of the platform. And voila! We have dynamic environment. With that out of the way, we now begin to actually animate our character. The only question, of course, is how exactly do I go about doing that when I've never even done this type of animation before? Screw it! I'll just go ahead and try it and see what happens. And while I'm at it, I can elaborate on what it is about each of these first pass styles that are so beneficial for the learning experience. In particular, with the stick figure here, as Sinigo talks about in his video, we gain access to the swing of the shoulders and the hips, whereas normal stick figures, they connect their shoulders up on their neck, and they connect their hips straight up into their spine. 
We can play around with the swing and sway of bodies as they twist and contort without getting bogged down too much by the details of anatomy. So here I'm finishing off today's work by doing the section of the animation where the character is going to be jollily approaching the gap. And I really wanted to go out of my way to express and overexpress even this jolly feeling. I'm trying to figure out how I want to have the elbows swing up. La -de -da -de -da, la -de -da -de -day as he's walking along before he gets to the gap and continues with all the other actions and motions that I want him to do. I spent a considerable portion of time looking at myself in the mirror, and I also did some of that because I needed to see where I wanted my poses to be, where I wanted my elbows to be, because if you'll notice here with the right elbow, because the angle that we're looking at here, the left elbow was always essentially going to be, I think, I think perpendicular? to the plane, no, parallel to the plane of the camera, so it's always just gonna be sitting there sideways. However, the right arm, as it crosses in front of the body, we have the fist over to the right and its elbow over to the left. Then we need the elbow to disappear behind the fist as the body twists back in the other direction. And at the end of that motion, we're going to have the elbow be on the right and the fist be on the left. The other consideration, of course, is the legs, which I have to keep track of the swinging of the hips, the length of the legs, especially when they're bending at the knees so that way they don't start elongating or shortening in really awkward ways that don't make any sense, and also keeping track of the floor, which is something that I didn't realize until about halfway through, because one of the downsides with doing a straight ahead is that you lose track sometimes of the size and shape and the location of whatever it is that you're drawing, so you end up looking differently on the final frame when you're done than you did on the first frame. So later on I end up having to compensate for not keeping track of where my feet are and the length of my legs are in relation to wherever an agreed upon floor would be for all of my frames and I have to adjust my lengths and my spacing accordingly to make sure that everything's consistent for when I do eventually loop the animation and when doing my spacing for the final product. Speaking of the final product, I sort of came to grips with the fact that I'm not really going to worry too much about perspective now that I spent all that time worrying about perspective. What I really mean by that is I'm not going to worry about the size, the shape, or anything of this character as I'm drawing it because I can just resize all the individual frames later once I have them all. So yes, he's going to be starting off smaller in the background and then get larger in the foreground, but I can just literally drag and resize the image. I don't, it's already gonna be hard enough for me to keep track of the complexities of motion, etc. while I'm doing these drawings. I don't need to make that process even more complicated by adding in external factors that aren't going to help make this look better. At least not at this particular moment. So now here, if you look at the right arm, we're having a reverse of the problem that we had back at the beginning. Whereas first we had to figure out how is it that we get the arm to go from being in front of the body to contorting around to the back, we now have to go from the back around to the front. And I've sort of created this like punching nature to his jolly jaunt, Whereas his arms come ahead when they're making their way in front of the body, they do this punch forward, punch forward as he swings back and forth. So I have to get the timing right so that way the arm punches forward and then swings up, but at a similar pace to the left arm going back. Because here's what I have to do now. I have to take the first frame that I made, drop it all the way in the back, and then take these last couple of frames, and instead of just having the freeform ability to go where they please, they actually need to, much like a pose-to-pose -pose drawing, ease into that first frame, thus closing my loop. And there you have it! All the setup that I need to make myself a wonderful scene. We have a really great platform to work with, which I'm really happy the way that it came out. I also still have the grid lines, which I'm going to use as references for the straight 
direction that I want him to walk in, but that's all stuff that I'm going to take into account with future Dan Beardshaw videos where he actually talks about using perspective and references for each of your objects, and he as a character counts as an object, so that's going to be all the resizing stuff which I'll be able to do. I really like the platform and the environment and the gap that I've made, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what I'm going to do with it. As for the person, I gotta say I'm actually super happy with the way that this jaunt came out. I mean, it's definitely so much more fluid than the facial animation that we made last time. Like, that's entirely for sure here. And now, it's, you know, it, it seems like a little static at this angle because the head's in the same place while it looks like the feet are actually dipping down below the floor. But it's gonna be the opposite of that in the final product because I'm going to orient the body and itself getting larger as it comes into the foreground based off of actually where the feet are going to be. So all of that will end up looking realistic with him bobbing up and down as he walks. So overall, this is so much of an improvement over the last exercise. I'm really excited with where we're going with this one. And, of course, thank you all so much for joining me for this, and I certainly hope that you all have a wonderful however long. Thanks a bunch for sticking around to the end, and if I somehow managed to hold on to your attention this far, consider subscribing for more episodes, and some sick music videos of my own in the future. As for today's honorable mention, I'd like to toss a shout out to Pixabay for all their awesome royalty-free images that I've used over the course of my channel. 